Hey YouTube, nice sunny day this morning, Saturday morning. I don't know if the date exactly, but in uh, June, uh, May, yeah, it's May. Got my forsythia growing up there, which is always a good sign for spring. Uh, thermometer says it's 56. I'm out in a t shirt and it is a little cool. I had gotten a comment last night about, um, you know, stacking wood and, you know, why wood doesn't work the way I stack it. Look, this certainly isn't my invention. Uh, man has figured this out long before I have. But <clears throat> here's something I want to say. Um, yesterday I made a comment that I'm going to leave this wood sit out for a little bit to let the sun take some of the moisture off of it. Now, I watch this stuff very closely. So if you look at this top board here, you'll notice that the board is flat yet, it's straight, it's basically touching all the stickers, there's no cup or, can or uh, um, twist in it. Now when you, if this board were to start to do something different, then it would need weight on it. Here's the thing, <clears throat> it's very difficult to tell whether a board's going to twist or not and which way it's going to twist because of, you know, the grain in it. For instance, like if you just look just loosely at this, there's grain here that goes this direction around these knots. You can see here the grain comes up, goes over, so it's very hard to tell which way a board is going to warp. But here's something that I can tell you, and I know that it's a, it, it does affect wood, and you can pretty much um, use this as a reliable source. If you take a piece of wood like this, and you cut it, say like right here, and you leave that one piece sit out, <clears throat> especially if it's clear, you know, if, you, if, if there's no knots or anything in it, and if it's straight grained, the board will, what it'll do is it'll start to dry on the top, and the board will start to cup. Now this has a lot to do with the cut, you know, the grain pattern, but basically it'll start to cup. And what the wood does is it bends towards the dry side, okay, towards the dry side. So what you can do, and I've done this many times, you can actually spray water onto the top of that with a little sprayer and let the wood absorb enough water to actually straighten itself out and it will straighten itself out and then if you take that wood and you put it under pressure so that it so that nothing so that it won't so that it doesn't cup by the stress that's in the wood it doesn't have enough strength to over you know to overpower whatever weight you put on it you can keep boards straight and that's the basic concept here with this I mean, you can go down to Lowe's, Georgia Pacific, and all them other big companies certainly know more than I do about lumber. And um, they still have bent boards. You can go down to Lowe's and buy all the twisted boards you want. There's piles of them that you can get for discounts. They're not worth anything. You can't use them for nothing. And, you know, well, I guess you can use them for something, like firewood or little, little projects. But basically... Um, you know, they know a lot about stacking wood. They do stack it, they kiln dry it and all. And there's a lot of things that affect the way wood handles. But when wood is in this state, and this wood was just cut yesterday, so it's wet. It's got a high moisture content. Now, I, I didn't bring my moisture meter with me here, and I, I will go get it, but you're probably looking at 27% or more on this hemlock, or on this uh, white pine. So I'm in the greenhouse and I just want to show you something here. When I started cutting pine, um, this piece came out of a flitch and I really liked what I see here. This, this is nice and straight, it's flat, it's not cupped or anything, but it wasn't always like that. When I first cut this board out of here, I liked the width of it and it was nice and straight. But what happened was, and what I want you to notice is the grain is pretty uniform through here. It's pretty straight grain. But it's not a it's not a quarter sawn cut either. This is a slab sawn. You see the grain on the pattern there? This is slab sawn. So you would expect this to warp pretty hard, you know, 
um, up this direction, like not warp but cup or warp. But here's what I'm after here with this. Um, by putting a little bit of water on one side and I was spraying it on something like with a hand sprayer, you know, like a Windex bottle. I sprayed water on it and I managed to bring it back from being cupped because it did, it did uh, turn cupped or it did cup. I managed to take it from being cupped back to straight. Now if you notice there, there's about 8% moisture content in this board. Now, 8% is normal for in the greenhouse here, I would say. And what we can do is we can just stab one of the 2x4s that are in the wall. And you can see that's at 8%. 8%. So 8% is what it is in the greenhouse because of the heat that's in here. Now, I have taken other things and tried to do the same stuff. And I'll just show you here. I have two things up on the rack. Let me just gra grab them. I cut, it was uh, Halloween time, and my daughter had asked me to cut some pumpkins for her. And, you know, I just cut them just for the heck of it. No, I don't break my neck here. I just cut these pumpkins out of some uh, red oak. Now, the, these, this is red oak here, and these pumpkins were just laying against the wall for a while. Now, if you look at this one, you can see that it's fairly flat, has a little bend to it on this side, okay? This one has a major bend to it, it's, or cup, I should say, not bend, cup. So this has a major cup. Now, here's the thing. If you wet this side, where the cup is, you can make this board go straight again. And I'll show you how to do that. Alright, so I have a garden hose here. <coughs> and um, you can see, you can see that this side of the thing is up off the bench and all. Okay? And so is this side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put water on here. I'd rather have a spray, but this doesn't really spray very well but I want to saturate this side of the wood and I want to show you what happens to this and once you start to understand this you'll know what to do with the wood that you have stacked if you come up with the correct diagnosis or deductions here okay so that thing's pretty wet And we're going to watch what happens with this. And then this one, um, this one has a check in it, and there's also a check in that one. But this one has checks in it, but it's fairly flat. I mean, I could, my daughter could probably still use this if she painted it orange or whatever, put a little something on it to keep it from uh, getting too bent. If you paint it, it'll hold the moisture and it'll, it'll pretty much stay the way it is. That's why good furniture, and, I, and I'm not here to argue with you furniture guys, but good furniture should be polyurethane totally underneath all the way around it everywhere to steal it against losing any moisture. So we're just going to come back here then and see what happens to these after they suck up this moisture. So while we're waiting for that water to get absorbed into that wood, I want to uh, make a little video here and answer a question. Um, look, WD-40 in a container like this is a little bit expensive. You know, I mean, relatively speaking for what you're getting. Spray this right here. So you're looking, there's, there's a guide roller, and here's a guide roller. I'll start this blade to running. I want to be on the opposite side, but right here's where I spray it. And what that does is it cleans the rollers as well as the blade. And it takes the um, sap off of it really quick. You can tell when the sap's building up because you'll hear a certain kind of noise that the blade makes as it runs over the guide rollers. And if the guide rollers pick up sap, they're pushing the blade down. 
So it could be that one guide roller might pick up sap, like this one may pick up more sap than this one, because this is the one on the outside of the wood with the saw blade going that direction. So then it could be cutting a slight uh, angle to the wood. It's Usually these things are not major problems because you can plane them out or you know if you're using rough cut lumber what what does it matter or, um, you know an eighth of an inch here an eighth of an inch there isn't going to hurt anything but the problem is here is I or the thing that I'm just trying to tell you is I spray it right here in front of this guide roller with the blade going that direction okay and then I had another question um, about the spacing of the teeth yeah, these are 7 eighths of an inch from this point to that point. That's the teeth I use. These are called double hard teeth from Wood Miser. And I find these to be very easy to hand sharpen. So I do that. Now, you know yesterday I cut 340 board feet with these yesterday. With this one tooth. Or, yeah, with this blade yesterday. So it's going to be needing some sharpening. Now my next wood that I'm going to be cutting is this red oak that's over here. It's not real big so it shouldn't give me too much grief and it's fairly, fairly, relatively straight although this log here it looks like a banana. But the rest of them are pretty straight. So I'll be cutting these up as soon as I can. The only problem is, is I, I have nowhere to put them. So I need to get the wood planed in the kiln so I'm going to be working on that next next meaning in the major realm of things. For now I need to clean this up. That is absolutely next. So once I get that out of here then all I have is pine flitch or oak flitches once I cut again and that I can use for firewood on my firewood pile. Okay it's about a half hour later and we got that cleaned up. Do a little bit of raking there and get rid of that uh, wood. I'm going to take it to the guy that wants it. Okay, for you guys that are doing YouTube, uh, for our, my YouTube channel for the um, hydroponic stuff, here's the wood miser girl. And what she's doing here, <laughs> you take these little plastic cups, put about a third of the cup with perlite, add a dash of water, not much because the, the, um, Perlite doesn't really absorb water. The water just goes in between it. It sort of like has surface area. That's what keeps it um, wet. You pick up on the tray so that when you pull the plant up, you bring all the roots with it. If you don't pick up on the tray, the roots will stay down. You see how long those roots are? And you want them to go down to the bottom of the cup. Just like the wood miser girl's doing here. And then you want to take perlite and fill it a cup uh, just about full. And then what you're doing after that is add a little bit of water to it. This is how you transplant them from the seedlings. And you don't want much water. You don't want to see water in there. Okay? But they'll get watered again before we leave here today. But you just want to take and put a little bit of moisture in there so that the see, uh, plant doesn't get overwhelmed. And also, the, the solution she's using here is the solution that's used for lettuce. So that means it doesn't have a lot of chemical in it, but it has enough to get these plants to understand that they're not going to always be just sucking on water. So that's how you do it. And like I say, make sure you pick up on the, the seed planter to get those roots out of there. Because if you don't, they'll tear off. And any root you get that comes into the pot it's going to be better. Yay! That looks like the wood miser pearl dropped that one. Yay! It landed very nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Just where it wanted to be. <laughs> okay. Is it sip? Yeah. And there it goes. Alright, that's good. Now, home's in a mother's heart. That is absolutely true. Well, and with Mother's Day coming up, I want to wish all the moms a very happy Mother's Day okay. on Sunday. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay, I'm um, showing you what I did here. This is the status of these pumpkins. Now, I'm only watering one side of the wood, okay? So what I did was I threw 
a rag on top of there because right now there's a breeze and it's very warm for our area and it's sort of drying the, uh, the uh, water off the wood too quick. I want it to soak in so that's why I put these rags on here. And then you're going to see just how much this wood moves even from just being a little wet. Now one of the other things I thought you might like to see is I started putting this uh, planer together. This is a 1.5 horsepower motor. It can be wired for 110 or 220. Right now it's hooked up for, or it's wired for 110. And I'm going to use the 110 for the moment. But you can see it's a pretty hefty motor. This is a planer molder, so I can cut either plain boards or I can cut molding with it. So I'm slowly putting this together. I'm sort of doing it at night when I got nothing else to do. Guys, I want to talk to you about electronics for a little bit here. I get a lot of comments <clears throat> about like the uh, the metal detector and I get comments about chainsaws and all kinds of stuff. Look, I don't know if you've ever heard this term, but it's called comparison shopping. Okay, or comparative shopping. Listen here. This is a track phone. I got this phone about 15 years ago, okay? And this phone works fine. Right now it's dead because I don't really call nobody. I don't want to be called. So here's the thing. I bought this phone 15 years ago. I hang it in my truck and if I go somewhere, that's I, I have the same hook in all the trucks that I have. I just hang it in there, take it with me. I have never replaced the battery on this phone. It still works, it's just right now not charged. I can call the same people I called when I had a smartphone and it costs me nothing a month because I only buy minutes twice a year I buy 90 minutes okay and that's all the talking I need to do on the telephone and I'm happy to have it now when I was a teacher I had to have a Blackberry smartphone that's the first smartphone I think they came out with and it was pretty nice. You could send uh, PDF files. You could go on the internet and stuff. I don't need to do that with this. So therefore, I don't need a BlackBerry or whatever smartphone they have today. I don't need that smartphone and pay a two, three hundred dollar a month payment when I can have this that does all I need it to do. Okay. Now try to understand where I'm going here with this. When I buy my small chainsaw. I buy the chainsaw for my convenience, for my benefit. I don't care if that chainsaw has 510 horsepower and you guys who want a big horsepower saw, you just snub your nose up at my little saw. My saw does what I need it to do. Every tree that I brought onto this property has been cut this past year by that little uh, saw, that 270 saw from Still. Now here's the thing, the same way this fits the bill for me, we're going to talk about this. Look, this, these scanners are not expensive. I think this is under $40. So here's the point. Is it worth having and is it going to work for me? Well, I, at this point, I can't say positively, but what I can say is this. I don't have to be able to find all kinds of tiny little things. Because when I'm sawing wood, if there's a finishing nail in the wood, I'm not worried about no finishing nail because I'm going to zip right through that and I'm not even going to know I hit it, okay? If the saw starts to act up after I hit the finishing nail, fine, then I'll work with it. But let me just say this. Because of the bark on a tree and stuff, this is more what you're going to find in a tree, okay? Just the bark alone tells you you need to have a long nail to be able to get through the bark and hang something up. So chances are either this or a staple that a farmer may have used to put wire up is what's going to work. So I turn on the super scanner. Okay, and let's, we're going to do some testing here. I'm going to let it warm up a little bit. I think it has to go through a cycle or something. Okay, so there we go. It's telling me that there's something there, something there, something there. Now it does tell you that you have to keep it moving. 
Okay, so it does it with the with the nail right there. Now, how about if we cover a, a nail with a board and the nail's down in there about a foot or about an inch? Is it going to find it? Now, apparently, it's not going to find that. Okay, because I'm not getting any reading there. Uh, there we got something. Now I don't know if that's coming from the sides of the wood, you know, out through the sides there, but... Okay, so let's try one of these carbide nails. This is a really hard concrete nail. Okay, so it's really not showing up there. Now let's see what happens if the nail is in the board, inside the wood, and how far down it can actually do something. So since I'm not using these four, these two by fours here for anything in particular, I'm not using these two by fours. I don't know if you guys saw that. Let me maybe I better go over that again. So I put a nail here, and I covered it with a 1x3, and I'm not getting anything. Okay. Now I'm going to take the same nail, and I'm going to drive it into, let me drive it into this tree like this. So let's try that. Now you can see with the nail in that way, it's down there about a, a, an inch or so. Apparently there's something to compare it to. Now, whether it does it under two inches, so it's picking up the nail that I drove into there. All right, that's pretty interesting. Now, how about if the nail was this way? Huh, that's pretty interesting if that's picking that up. So, uh, let me try driving this one in here. I think I'll drive this in about an inch. Well, maybe I'll put it in the middle. I'll drive this one in on the side. So, it's a little bit iffy. It's picking this nail up that's driven in here. See that? From the bottom. And it's probably halfway. And it's picking this nail up that's driven in from the side. That's about three quarters of an inch there into the wood. Now, uh, you know, for me, now it's going to be different for, you know, the furniture builders, but for me, I'm two inches, if I can detect that two inches, I'm okay. Now why it was going through six inches of wood and picking up the bunk frame, I don't know. I guess the bigger the metal, the more you can get at. Now let's see what I wanted to do. Yeah, let me see if I can't. All right, let's see. So we have this one showing up. That, that'll fix that. But if we turn it this way, Picking that up. Now, you can see that the nail that I drove in there is only like a half of an inch from the surface. Um, the, the detector is not going to be good if it, it's not going to be what I really need if it can't go down two inches into the wood. I mean, let's face that, that's part of the deal. So we're going to drive this halfway in. So let's take this one. Drive it into my finger there, roughly. 
Okay, so that nail that's in there, there's about two inches of wood there. And if you think about it, now this isn't, naturally this isn't a, you know, coverall, but when you're cutting a cant, you're cutting from the sides, sort of radially, radially from the sides actually. So the nails are more or less going to be straight down in. You're hardly going to find nails sideways, but that doesn't mean you won't because you would find bob wire sideways or barbed wire. So let me just see here. Okay guys, so we went that far and um, by the way, the scanner, like if, if I didn't say it before, does not pick up bullets. I, I tried it. It will pick up a lead ball. In other words, um, if you hold it in your hand and run it under the scanner, it'll beep every time. But I think that's because there's tin in a bullet. So, okay, now here the deal. It says here that you can adjust, there's a sensitivity screw inside here, and that you can adjust this screw by turning it, turning the machine on. I have to have a really small screwdriver, and wouldn't you know it, this sucker don't want to stay in here for me. Anyway, there's a really small screw in there, and it says that if you turn it against clockwise and wait for the red light to come on, that um, that'll be set to maximum intensity so we're gonna have to see if this works boy that's a small freaking hole there So it says you should turn it until the light turns red. I'm not sure if I'm turning it there yet. It doesn't look like it. I think I'm turning it now. So you, can t you should turn it uh, against clockwise. And that'll be m maximum sensitivity. Now it says that the light's supposed to turn red. It doesn't seem like it's adjusting there, but let's see. Nothing yet. I've turned that screw pretty much there. If it was going to do something, I would say that it should have done it by now. So let me read these directions. It says, turn the unit on by pushing the on and off switch until it clicks and the green light is lit. The green light is lit. The detector is now operational, though an increase in sensitivity and depth range can be achieved by turning the sensitivity adjuster until the red light is lit and a constant audio, audio tone is heard. Turn the sensitivity adjuster anti-clockwise. I guess this wasn't written by an American, but anti-clockwise. Turning this anti clockwise and it's turning it pretty much. No, I don't. It seem like it's actually making much of a difference in it. But let's check let's check. I wasn't picking this up before. Alright, so let's put another board on top of that. Now it's picking up that head that's down one inch. These other two nails would be down two inches. That is would be ideal if I could be hitting those. Let 
not picking them up at two inches. Now I am picking this one up, but it's only one inch because of the one inch board. Okay, it's picking up those bigger nails. Ugh. Drop my screwdriver. So I just want to see if I can adjust this even more. The, the screw is still turning in there, so I don't know how far out it comes. But it says you should be able to turn it until this thing turns red and the light comes on. Probably the screw will fall the heck out on me knowing this. Yeah, I've turned that thing pretty far already. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so it is doing that. So now we turn it in. A little bit more yet. Well, I guess it does do what it says. You just gotta have some patience with it. All right, so now, let's see what it does with this put on top. Wow, that definitely changed that. Okay, so let's see, can it pick up something as small as this through a one inch board? Turn it this way. You can pick it up. How about through a two inch board? Now we want to keep that somewhere where there's no nails down near this end here. Well, it is picking that up. So that is what I would really need. That that should work now for me. If it can pick up two something two inches under, that's that's what we're after. Now before I adjusted that sensitivity knob on here, uh, it didn't do that, and I hadn't adjusted it yesterday because you know how guys are. We don't read the directions. I finally read them about ten minutes ago. So. Yeah, that is picking up, let me go even further out here. That's picking that up and it's two inches you know, that's a two by four. So let me just put it to you like this. Now, if this thing can repeatedly, you know, with a little bit of effort scanning, and it does tell you, like I say here, to keep moving. If it will pick up something that's two inches down, that is going to save me from hitting nails when I cut a two inch board. So that's all I would really need personally now. Now, if you're going to cut a three inch board or if I cut a four by four, then naturally that's, you know, not going to be what I, what I would want. But if it picks up at two inches and, you know, we're doing this here, the, it's not actually in the tree. I can't say that this is a scientific, you know, trial, but well, I guess it would help if I turned it on. It's picking that up and it's two inches under the wood. So I'm pretty satisfied with that. Now, um, like I say, if we take, and we put this on here, and you can see where the heads of those nails are. So we're gonna put this here, and let's see if I come straight in on that. My keys. Okay, so it's, You know, I, I, 
it, it seems like it's working at two inches now with that sensitivity thing adjusted. And I'm, that's, I'm okay with that. Yeah, so, not bad. So let me grab a, another 2x4 and see if it'll go for me. So here's a 2x4. We'll take that one off and put this one on. See how this works. Let's move all this stuff away from here a little bit. Now, get this out of here. Now that would have, that, that wood is down there. For that nail, this nail would be down three inches there. picking up the one, but it's not picking up the other one for some reason. Well, it's picking this nail up here at like three inches. Now, this one here, it should pick that up at two inches. Yeah, it does. So it's, it's proving to be pretty proficient at two inches. So it's picked up the three nails, this one, there's one here and there's one there, through a three inch piece, or a two inch piece. When you add, when you put two, uh, three inches between the nail and you, it doesn't do it. It still picks up the two inch, uh, two inches down. So I would say then, just from what you know, this little bit of a test, that two inches is the maximum that it's gonna pick up nails. And like I said before, for me, the type of cutting that I do, two inches should should work for me, okay? Even when I cut flitches, I'm not always down that deep, although at the stump, sometimes it's a little deeper. Now that's three inches there. It wants to pick it up, but I'm not sure if it's picking up the head from this side or not. Let me just try going this direction. So there's a nail here. And then there's one back here, and then there's one right there. So at two inches, it seems to pick up pretty proficiently, but it doesn't pick up at three inches as proficiently. So I would say that this scanner is, you know, looks like I scratched myself. This scanner is pretty good for two inches. And we're going to try it and see. Would I like it to be able to go down further? Sure I would, you know, but there comes a time, I mean, if you're cutting a four inch cant, you know, let's say you have four inches left on a cant, you're gonna cut three boards out of it. It's really not gonna help me if it's gonna pick up the bunk and not pick up anything else. Now, if I was to take uh, the scanner along a tree and see if there's something in the tree, that's a different story. So in other words, like let's say right here we have a log. We have this oak log here. Now are we going to see anything in this log? I don't know. And I don't know if there's anything in here either. That's my keys. I just want to make sure it is working.
Now, for the most part, we have not had nails in anything. I think there was one tree or two two logs that I had nails in. One was a hickory, and the other one was a red oak. So I'm not going to bother driving nails into the log that I want to cut because that would be foolish. I'm just going to uh, go after cutting them. But, you know, I did the best testing I could do for what I have. Oh, here, here's that uh, little log here, or stump. Now, see, it picks up the lead bullet that went in here was all lead, but not the uh, coated bullet, the jacketed bullet. So it does pick up bullets or at least the lead part. Although there's lead inside of the copper, I don't know why it's... It's picking it up pretty regularly. So that's something. Huh. Sort of amazed by that. So it is picking up the lead bullet, and it's picking up to two inches away or two inches into which is what I need so just to recap that a little inside of these boards at the one inch mark there's two nails coming in here oh. I remember to turn it on now there's there's one here but it's only one inch down okay And that's the two nails there and here. So it's going through two inches of wood. As far as I'm concerned, I'm happy with that. Now this, if we could pick this one up underneath this. Yeah, we are. So for me, it's going down at least two inches. Now again, if I cut four by fours or six by sixes, you know, or any big timber, this may not tell you what's in there. But you know, no, nobody's to say that the, the nail you're looking for is in the center somewhere. We don't know where the nail is. That's the purpose of having this thing, because we don't know where it is. But at this point, regardless of whether this is a Chinese knockoff, and I don't care about that. You know, I, 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 I've seen scanners that are $200 or $500 or $2,000, depending upon what you want to spend on it and what you want to do with it. All I'm interested in is saving most of my blades. And I have cut no 6x6s, six I have cut 4x4s four though, but very few of them, okay? So, from what I can see here, just cutting lumber, which is what I like to cut, this thing should work good for me within a 2 inch area, okay? If, I, if there's a nail within 2 inches, this should find it. Hey YouTube, so this is that piece of red oak that I was showing you yesterday that um, I put water on the sunny side of it, the side that it was, had dried and cupped, and you can see how flat it is now. The purpose of me um, showing you this isn't um, to show you how to do anything with wood that you're, let's say you're, that you're trying to flatten out while you're building something because it's going to take too long to do that although you could do it you could but if you notice the check that was in there closed up now not it's still got a crack in it but you don't see it anymore because what's happened is the wood has swollen on one side because of the water going into it but it did flatten it out pretty flat if you look across there and that was my point of the video was to just show you that um, if wood is kept under pressure and even if it rains on it uh, for air drying, if you have pressure on it, it will stay fairly straight. Now, you know, granted, this has straight grains in it, so it's not so bad, but there are some boards that you just cannot, no matter what you do, keep them straight because of the grain. But a lot of times, stacking it and even though it gets wet and all and the sun hits it, this is proof that you can overcome that by keeping weight on it or by uh, putting water on it 
spraying water on wood in a certain way and then putting pressure on it to keep it flat. Well, I managed, it's raining outside today, really heavy rain. So I managed to get the planer together. This is the planer molder 13 inches wide, it'll plane. These uh, guides that are on here right now, this one and the other black one there, they're just there temporarily for, um, they're for when you do molding to help guide the molding through. There's another piece or two I gotta put on there yet for molding, but I'm not gonna be doing molding right now, so just figured you wanna see how far we got with that. It's not bad looking. Um, it's pretty much no frills, a crank for the up and down, an exhaust port to get rid of the chips and dust. Um, there's no extension tables on here. I don't know if I can, if they sell them. If they sell them, I may put extension tables on it. Otherwise, because uh, I really don't care for it with that short table on there. It doesn't give me much space to set something on. I didn't realize that it didn't come with them. But um, I had it running already, so everything seems good on it. So we should be in good shape then.